Now for WNBA, NBA, I can't remember, those numbers have to be less because your rosters are smaller. Yep. So I just wanted to know, how did you guys get started in sports really quickly? We'll start with you, Sam. Yeah, well, honestly, uh, it was good to be up here, obviously, with all these phenomenal athletes with my brother as well. He's younger than me, but he was the first person to play sports in our family. And so I actually, in so many ways, followed him on the path of football. We played football together, basketball. We were messing up the house. Our parents said, go do something outside. That was kind of how we got into sports. But he was the one who played football first. He was doing you know, playing running back and scoring all these touchdowns, all these things. And I didn't want to play football. I was too much hitting and physical, all these things. And I, all of a sudden, I started to play, and I started to get better at it. And all of a sudden, I started getting scholarships, which is free school. And then it became pretty easy after that. And then that got us here for you. Yeah, so. Hello, hello? Yeah. Um, imagine being a 5, 10, 7th grader. <laughs> Tall, gangly, awkward, walking into gym class, coming from Nigeria, and also sports was not something that we watched, it wasn't something we were exposed to. It was all boots, 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 boots. Um, so I walked into gym class, and I'm like, yeah, you, we're going to play volleyball. <laughs> and I kind of just fell into sports just because of my height and my stature. Um, I think it was the biggest lesson for me, especially at that age, being so tall and awkward. It, it forced me to, to kind of grow into myself. It helped me establish a voice. Um, it gave me a sense of community. So I was forced into sports, but it ended up working out for the time. Hi, everybody. Oh, what a look at me. Right, no. Hello. Hello. Oh, there we go. Hey everybody, um, first and foremost, it's really an honor to be here. This is home for me, Houston. So, you know what that is? Um, but this is also family. You know, a lot of these people here are friends, and I've known or followed everyone and their careers. And, you know, as you mentioned, fell into sports. I always say, my sisters and I say we fell into sports, but we fell in love with it. Now, very similar scenario. Uh, the first thing, four girls, one house, no boys. You guys know how that is in an African household. But our parents sort of encouraged us to be confident, regardless of you know, the gender stereotypes of America and just the world in general. So four girls tearing up the house after getting you know, good grades, and my mom put us into gymnastics. And so obviously, all legs in gymnastics, I always tell people, y'all know the Amiga bars, right? We go around, and I would never be able to make it around. It's because my legs are so long, my butt would hit the floor, and I never had enough traction to go over. And so my mom's co-worker was basically like, hey, your girls are too tall for gymnastics, put them into basketball. And so we fell into basketball, we fell in love with it, they taught us a lot of values, and it transformed our lives, and the, as he would say, the rest is history. Hi, Kate. Yeah, so um, my journey into sports was uh, pretty young. I was a soccer and basketball guy, but uh, my, my journey into football was pretty interesting. It's kind of funny. So the way I got into football was I actually got suspended from the bus uh, for two weeks, and I didn't. I needed to find a ride to school, so I told my dad that I want to join the football team, so he could take me to school, but not find out about me <laughs> <laughs> So when I was out there, I got picked by the football club, and I just fell in love with it. I didn't really know what they were doing out there, even with the equipment on, but I just fell in love with it, and I just kept diving deeper, deeper, deeper into it. And I saw an opportunity there for me, so that was that's my journey to football. <laughs> So I just wasn't that smart. <laughs> and so if you're not that intelligent, you better be good at something. Uh, nah, so I think I was eight years old, and I started watching YouTube clips of my favorite athletes, um, great athletes, running backs, etc. And I was like, hmm. And I taught myself how to play in different sports on YouTube, and that was really my way in. The funny thing I'm hearing is that there was YouTube for you really young. <laughs> You can learn a lot on YouTube. Uh, let's see about getting YouTube sponsorship. Uh, we also need to play a piano. It's your own TV here, not YouTube. Let's get into a local TV sponsorship. Hey, um, my name is Festus. Um, be fine, actually. I'm going by Be fine. I came to America. I came here in 2004. And when I came here, I never played basketball, wasn't an athlete. 
I was just going to school. My job was actually, I, I was thinking I was going to be a doctor. That's why I came here. All of us, eh? <laughs> and, you know, my, my journey to basketball to sports was different. Because when I came here, um, everybody, like I was 6'4", I was 14 years old, and everybody, they see me like, wow, basketball, right? And even when I decided, my uncle told me, I moved here to live with my uncle, and he told me, hey, you should play basketball. So I go to the gym, right, tall black kid, and I walk in the gym at first, everybody wants to pick me, I'm right, the big kid, yeah, let's pick him. Until they saw that, I, I didn't want to do that. I don't know what was going on. They don't show the basketball Like, the next day, nobody wanted to pick me. <laughs> but, you know, the reason why I tell the story like this is because that's why I started. Everybody counted me out. Right? It was just me and the basketball in the gym every day. And when you see me get drafted, when you see me win the NBA championship, when you see all these things, it's not me. It's all about it. It's all about it. All about it. When you see me win the NBA championship, I see you. So it's all about it. No, we thank God. <laughs> Um, I did want to get into this a bit because I did hear your podcast. I was going to say something about Bessis' podcast, uh, Rebuilding the Beast. He'll talk about it a little bit um, later. But if you've not listened to it, that's something I recommend as well. Um, he did say in his book, I knew that story about you wanting to be a medical doctor and having to um, have sports be the way you pay for that. And some of you have already talked about that. But I wanted to know, do you have any other sports-related ambitions? Did your parents... I can't imagine, my parents also wanted me to be a doctor. I'm a pharmacist, and five years after school, I've been a pharmacist for almost 10 years, and they were still wanting to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> do, you guys, like, do you guys have any sports related ambitions that, the non sports related ambitions that you wanted to do before you, know, you chose this path? Anyone? Are we just young and you play sports? No, me, me personally, I wanted to be like an architect. I was always attracted to real estate and building, so I was going to going to architecture, business, and things like that. Okay. That's cool. That is cool. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to go to this next question. Especially in kind of the climate that we're seeing today in sports, we're seeing a lot of athletes talking more about their mental health and um, just the, I guess, the weight of expectations and the pressure of performing. Um, and, you know, there's their own sport. We saw something with um, Naomi Osaka, I'm a huge tennis fan. So I was sad when she withdrew from one of the competitions that maybe she had to play. Um, but I wanted to know, how was game day for you guys? Like, did you guys, you know, did you guys have to work around the pressure that came with performing on the day? Or did you just love it? Well, just quickly before we get to that, just to the mental health point, because I think that's a really hot topic right now. Not even for athletes alone, but for Nigerians, there's this pressure that we feel. And oftentimes we feel it because of our parents or our culture. A pressure to perform, a pressure to be perfect, pressure to achieve. If you're not number one, then it's nothing. And so imagine that, and then take that to the basketball court, to the football field, take that to the classroom. Like that, that's heavy pressure. And so I, I resonate with whether it's Naomi Osaka, Simone Biles, some of these athletes who are feeling this pressure and pain. That's, that's honestly why I wrote the book. That's why I wrote Let the World See You. Like, I was feeling, I played nine years in the NFL, average is three. So three times the average, yet still not put where you're clapping, but in my mind, I wasn't enough. I wasn't the superstar. I started early in my career, then I broke my leg. I gotta find a way to get back and be the best. All of a sudden, I'm limping through, you know, my fourth, fifth, and sixth year. And now I'm looking at my coaches and they're like, who is this guy? It's not what we saw in film. My teammates are, are wondering, why are you scared to make a play? You don't want to be great? All the while I'm hiding my injury because I still got to perform and achieve. And you start wearing these masks. This is pre-COVID. That's <laughs> <laughs> some of y'all wear masks. I got up on you. Now, you, wear, you wear these masks. You you pretend that you're trying to fit in, you're trying to achieve and all these things, and it's not really you. And so like, just to that point with Naomi and Simone and, and even other athletes before him, and Nigerians specifically, like I talked about that now, but growing up in a Nigerian household, but went to a predominantly white school, right? Best school in the, in the country, right? Well, before that. 
I respect it a little more. Um, a predominantly white school in Dallas and the number one rated private school in the nation. St. Mark's. And then went to a, a predominantly black church, but then a Nigerian household. So it was like achieve, 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 achieve. Then you get good at sports. Achieve, 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 achieve. What happens when you get injured? What happens when you don't succeed in a way that other people believe success is? What do you do then? And that was a battle that I struggled with of like finding out who I was. It wasn't until, honestly, like I had a lot of success. I know we we're gonna talk about this in a little bit, but like my two of my lowest moments in sports, the first one was my rookie year. I tied the sack record for the Arizona Cardinals. Right? So check me out. And we can clap. Um, I was miserable. Like I was throwing my helmet because the guy was holding me and I should have had another shack and didn't call in all these things. I was mad. And like as I'm walking off, I'm literally walking off the field at halftime. Just tie the record. On the big screen they show Sam Macho ties the record. And I'm over here pissed off, frustrated, upset, because it's something that happened on the field. So instead of celebrating with my teammates and what God had done, I was frustrated. No joy. No joy. And then the second probably lowest moment was uh, well, we're family here. I had to sign a multi-year, multi-billion dollar contract in the NFL. My eighth year in the league. You said multi-billion. Hey, multi hey, I mean, hey, so hey, before we talk about multi-billion now, hold on now. Hold on, I'm going to ask. Talk about our first book deal. I'm going to ask. How many millions? I got one, two, three, four. Ask about it. Ask about it. You got to quiet real quick. Hey, Million dollar contract in the NFL, and I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy. Like, what's wrong with that? Like, what is wrong with us when we achieve the highest levels if we don't have joy and peace and hope? And so, for me, talking about Simone and Naomi and talking about talking about our mental health, not only as athletes but also as Nigerians, like, there's something there. There's something there, and I believe, like, because I think that when you're you, like, when you're who God made you to be. Not who your mom and dad wants you to be. That's right. Not who your friends want you to be. Not your classmates and teachers. When you're who God calls you to be, I think three things happen. Number one, God gets the glory. That's right. Number two, the people around you benefit. Yeah. And number three, the world around you thrives. And so it took me achieving what I thought was the best thing and feeling empty before I realized that I already had everything I needed. Let's hear from you, Festus. The question was like, do you remember the question? No. <laughs> the question was, no. I think he stumbled up so well. He did something like that. I think that's his mom. But um, I was going to call back. You already invoked the injury, Sam. So I do want to invoke injuries, continue on that um, path. And I was going to ask you in particular, Festus, tell us more about your podcast and what you developed it for. And um, kind of talk to us about how you've been able to manage your injuries or you know the setbacks that have come with your career and how you what you've learned through that process. Alright, so one of the, the greatest things that you just said was everybody put the mask on, right? You look at us up here, it's like Imai, you see everybody in here, and you're like, oh well, I've seen these guys on TV, right? They got their lives figured out. And that's what I thought. Like I thought that everybody who had success had to figure it out. Because we all put the mess on. You don't hear the stories of a guy who got injured and he's trying to figure it out his rookie year. You don't hear my story. You see me holding the trophy, but you don't know where I started. You don't know how hard it was. And so when you look at me, this is the social media age, you compare your closet, all the failures that you had, the fact that your house ain't right, your kids are going crazy, you're, you don't have enough money. You start comparing that to the picture that you see. But you don't know that I've been through that. You don't know that I came from Nigeria. I went through all these struggles. I went through mental issues as a kid. I went through, we are living, hearing gunshots all the time. You, didn't, you don't hear that. You just see the nice car. And so for me, that, that's the story I want to tell because I think we all need to hear this. Like people see me and like, yo, you're a positive person all the time. I'm like, man, I have to put this smile on every day. 
I went through an injury. That's something that people don't talk about as athletes. We disappear, and then we come back. It's like, well, I'm back two years later. Three years, I went through my injury. Six months, I was in the wheelchair. This is, this is happening. I, I've been through the story, right? So I did everything. I made it to the NBA. I won a championship. The next year, we're going to the second championship again. Best team in NBA history. We broke Michael Jordan's record. This is amazing. Life is great. Then I get injured. Signed the deal. I lost some money. In the wheelchair for six months. So life is not just up and up and you just, everything is easy. Like you have to keep fighting through and that's what faith is. And so for me, I want to tell those stories so people can be inspired to know that when you see me in my success, I work for this. He worked for this. He worked for this. She did. Everybody works for their success, right? But you have to persevere. There's faith involved. And that's, those are the stories I want to tell. I just want to tell real stories. And so I just got inspired to check, to, to read comeback stories. I would read stories of Jeff Bezos or of Phil Knight or, shoot, my Nigerian brother, Hakeem Olajuwon. He was telling me all these different stories about how he, he was, he was uh, dealing with discrimination as a Muslim player. You don't hear that part. You just hear that he's the greatest. So I want to tell these stories because I think they can help each one of us. We talk about mental health. As a Nigerian, we deal with this. I've had some of my best games. I won a championship, and that still wasn't enough because I had to run it back and win another one to make sure the first one counted. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> That's what we do. You know, so I think it's important for us to, to hear these stories because it makes us feel like we're seen. You know, sorry to make this long winded, but I have one. Talk about game days, right? One of my favorite moments in the NBA. It's like the weirdest thing, right? So the day before we played our first NBA Finals, so you gotta think, I'm on the Golden State Warriors, it's Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, all these people that everybody that watches basketball knows. And it's like, all right, we're going to the NBA Finals, we're gonna be playing against LeBron James. We're excited, right? It's, it's crazy, it's game, game day tomorrow. So the night before the game, I'm laying in the bed, I get in bed at like 10 o'clock, let me get my rest, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a good day tomorrow, right? The first day of the game. I'm laying in bed, it's 11 o'clock now. Uh, it's 12 now, 1 o'clock, my eyes are like this, but we playing in the finals tomorrow, oh my God. 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, I'm like, man, am I going to be able to, 3 o'clock, now I'm like, okay, now I'm tripping, now I'm, I'm starting to get anxiety. So my phone buzzes, I'm like, what the hell, who's texting me at 3 o'clock in the morning? Somebody, I think it was Draymond or somebody, anybody else still up? I can't see. <laughs> and the phone starts going, whoop, 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 whoop. everybody else is still up because we're all nervous because the first game is tomorrow. But you guys see us on TV like, oh man, we used to this. Nah, we're all figuring this thing out. That's the best moment in my NBA career because in that moment, we can all see each other. And we can all the next day we win, but that's because of that. <laughs> so, I love now that we have, I'm also a college coach, um, so I love now that this, this generation of student athletes have embraced what it means to address their mental health and put it before anything. I remember being a student athlete and that was not a thing we talked about. I, I was not able to articulate what it was until I grew up and um, started having those conversations with my student athletes and just reading up more on it. I had crazy performance anxiety. I mean, intense. I remember um, we just beat Stanford after Stanford had beat UConn. Yeah, it didn't happen often. It did not happen often. This is, this is after your time. But at the time, Stanford had just beat the number one team in the country, UConn. Um, and then we come into Stanford's home and we beat them. That's making us feel like we were doing something at the time, right? Um, and then we start conference play and we're at Oklahoma. And I'm just so nervous because at the time, there was so much expectation on my shoulders to perform. Let's talk about being Nigerian. I have a name, and I share a name with an individual that is an all-American, all-around player, her sister. Anytime I went anywhere, people would be like, ah, I played against you and your sister. I said, it was not me. <laughs> I said, it was not me and my sister. <laughs> um, so anyway, back to the game in Oklahoma. And I was just so riled up because we had just come off so many high performances and people expected us to continue excelling in the same trajectory that we had you know, started in. And I would come out of the game and I literally was just vomiting. 
vomit, and I would go back into the game and I'd keep on playing. Come back out, vomit, go back in and keep on playing. And my coaches were like, oh my God, y'all see that guy? Like, she's out there, she's getting everything, she's got her up, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, sis, I got performance inside. <laughs> <laughs> my head is going crazy. <laughs> um, so just, I, I think it's just so important for us to continue, especially now that I have my young student athletes, it's important for me to validate them and let them understand that it's okay, it's normal. You know, they put us on this pedestal, it's a platform that we have, and they expect us to be invincible. At the end of the day, we're all humans. And we all show up for the same thing. Anything else to add on that topic? Anyone? Okay, I'll move on. Shanae, I wanted to ask you this. I wasn't quite sure, but I think the Nigerian basketball women's team, you were considering joining the team, and was it CAS or was it Nigerian BDF? That was the basketball team that labeled you as a naturalized citizen. So tell us more about that, and why did they choose to do that, and why did you not accept that? Hello, okay, so well, before I get to my experience, my family's experience playing with the Nigerian national team, which by the way, the young women, badasses, yeah. love them, made history. And it's funny, um, because you mentioned my little sister, and it's funny, the performance anxiety that you talk about, you experiencing, when we came to know you, Neka, yourself, we had anxiety ourselves because she's Nigerian, she's not gonna quit. <laughs> I knew who I was going up against, I thought, oh, she's gonna quit, she's gonna quit. She will never quit because we're built different. And so, what you're experiencing, we're experiencing it too, but it was based off of your strengths, which made it unique. Um, Ucha, okay, so I've had a month. My family has had a month. For those who don't know, I play professionally at the WPA. I play with my big sister, Neka, um, on the Los Angeles Sparks. Yay! <laughs> and my younger sisters also play as well. Um, the baby just was on the Nigerian national team that just came back from Tokyo. So unfortunately, I missed yesterday's morning for Sibis because I had to go welcome her back. She was fine. She was just like, oh, it's magical. I was like, she was just happy for TikTok to be woke. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have another younger sister. She's right immediately. I'm number two. Um, Neck is the oldest. So, Namakai, Chinenya, Chisom, and Derema. Right? But, you know, it's like, Neka, Chine, Olivia, and Erica. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, funny part? Okay, so I'll go from bottom up. Erema, Chisom, Chinenya, Namakai, Ifemwa is my mom, and Peter is my dad. <laughs> So, um, with the Nigerian national team, this has been a dream of our families for a long time to stay connected to the continent. Uh, a lot of people don't know when I was at Stanford, I spent a quarter abroad studying in Nigeria. And the person who pushed me to do that was Secretary Dr. Condoleezza Rice, who, while I was there, was my major, in, uh, my major, I guess you call it advisor. Um, because she runs the IR, the International Relations Department. And it's funny, when we think about our goals in life, everyone asks us, like, well, you know, we know we're gonna stop playing at some point, right? For me, it was it's hard, because there are so many other competing things. And so, when I went to Stanford, people were like, what do you wanna do? All I can focus on is, like, getting good grades, like we all know, and while it's like, proving to people that, you know, that, that conflict of achieving and achieving, that we're gonna be the best at whatever we do. And for me, it was harder because my sister naturally killed people. Like, number one, you know, draft pick. And I was at her draft, and I was like, whoa, I wanna do that as well. And the beautiful thing, and this is where I was like, we're shouting out, we're talking about mental health, and we talk about Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka. These are women's stories. So for the women in the audience that feel like mental health is something that people tend to look past, men, if it's addressing you, imagine how it's addressing women. And especially Nigerian women, because we have those same notions, but we have to operate in a world where men are dominated, and even Nigerian men can be more authentic in their space because we're used to men running the space. And so I think for our family, having four girls has been really special because we've had a girl dad that has told us, we didn't even know gender was a thing. He taught, you know, he's the first son in his family, you know what that means, he's the head of the household. And to instill in us a confidence where we can do whatever, we just have to operate and maneuver in different scenarios, that sort of, sort of opened our eyes to what the possibilities are. So we play basketball, and we're like, we're gonna play just like anybody else plays. If it's a boy playing, I'm gonna pull up and I'm gonna give you buckets. Oh! Period. 
Everyone's happy, he's equal, and he 
and also Aruba. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Emmanuel, you had a take that I perfectly understood. I was happy to see your point. And I, I, know I won't go through everything, but I wanted to know, how do you handle criticism you receive from the takes that you put out? Because that's part of your job. You have to, you know, give your opinions on these athletes. Tell the truth. <laughs> Do you want to clap back at the people who clap back at you? Or what? <laughs> what Everyone do you mean? he wants to. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Honestly, the most annoying part of my life is that everybody has an opinion. Oh, and I can't get away from it. Like, if I get on social media, black people hate me. White people hate me. Nigerian people hate me. Oh, uh, my like, Everybody just hates me. Not everybody, uh, it's not that bad. Hey, y'all like me. Uh, for now. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's tough. I, I, there's, there's no easy way around it, I'll be honest. Like, I understand why mental health issues exist more abundantly now than ever. I, I mean, imagine, I can scroll on my timeline right now. Give us an example, shall we? We know his life, so he's trying to bring the team. Yeah, let's see. No. Those two. Um, give an example, shall we? Um, I mean, any time you, I just log on anything, it's like, ah, oh, you're an Uncle Tom, you're a this, you're a that. Because people, people would rather, people would rather be jealous of someone instead of learning from that individual. And what I've realized, and I said this quote, hate will cause you to be jealous of someone you should be learning from. And that's in any industry. And so it's tough because like, I'm not saying it, whenever I say anything on television, I'm really just trying to speak the truth. But people don't want to hear the truth. People want to hear their truth. Kind of like life. Um, and so with Giannis, uh, I'm the biggest Giannis fan ever. But after he won the, the NBA championship, I was like, no, Giannis can't be the face of the league. But Americans don't understand exactly what I'm saying when I say he can't be the face of the league. I'm saying he can't be the face of the league because Nigerians are built different. And he didn't, he, he has, he has, he follows eight people on, on, on Instagram, six of which are his family. So he's not worried about the fame and all that. Like he grew up different. Nigerian parents. He grew up selling CDs till he was 15. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know you know the story. And so, uh, people just it's, don't get me started. But um, I guess to all suffice all of it to say, you have to be very confident in who you are and what you say. You have to believe what you say. You have to stand in what you say. You have to log off. Yes. Like you have to log. Um, and now I'll say what my co-host always says. He says, um, when you walk into the jungle, not every animal wants to be petted. Some just want your roar. And social media is the jungle. And so when, I, when you log on, you gotta remember, not everybody likes you, watch show. Some just want to roar. Um, and you gotta acknowledge that. <laughs> To, to piggyback off of that, or to ask you a question, sorry. Is it being Nigerian, doesn't that give you guys a sense of like, a sense of pride, but also confidence in yourself? Because regardless of what's happening around you, we always know that we have this identity. I don't know about you guys, I don't know if y'all feel what I'm talking about, but there's always something I lean back on every time. When we're in this world that's crazy and people are going crazy on Instagram and I come home and... Well, you're exactly right. Let's be real. Let's be real. Let's be real. Let's be real. Um, today said this. I can't say what I really want to say. Because if I really wanted to say it to anybody who says up to me, I would hurt your feelings. And I don't want to hurt your feelings because I'm not allowed to because I have a brand. I'm comfortable conversations with a black man. That is so nice. <laughs> but I can't really cut you like I want to. So when we fight, it's not a fair fight. So you're right. Like, I have that confidence, but I can't ever exude it on social media because I have too much to lose, like we all do. There, there's, when you talk about success, there's a pyramid. And a pyramid has a base. And a pyramid also has a top. 
And those that are successful are at the top of the pyramid. But everybody who comes at us is really, is those at the bottom. And so the confidence is right. Like I have that confidence and I think we all do, but, and today can attest to it too. I'm not allowed to say what I want to say. So okay, 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 okay. You are, but, and this is where I keep bringing women up, that experience is always telling him because we have these conversations because he can't say it, but that's why it's nice to have a family because behind closed doors, as we all experience the same thing. All of us have had bikes, all of us have platforms, but we all know, especially in this room, we can't be our full selves to be public. And so his experience of not, like, even you being able to engage on social media to a small degree is more than what we could probably engage because it's a zero room for error for us. And so I don't want to educate him as he's educating me, but that's the balance and the harmony with conversation, and I think that's his platform. I would just say, you know, um, the confidence of being Nigerian, it's not easy, it's funny. He, we were just talking because he just did his, oh, and your uh, excellence talk, and he was like, yeah, like, I haven't, this is COVID. Like, I haven't stood and talked in front of a room in a long time, but we have put on a game face, a mask, to do it in front of a camera in front of millions of people. And sometimes it's hard for us to negotiate that space and figure out what's productive in real time to autocorrect or tweet. And that's where that grace comes in, where you have people that can sort of push you, because I'm gonna always tell them how I feel about, like, tell them that, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, I'm not here for it. But I've heard his arguments and he heard mine, and we're better for it moving forward, and we won't make that mistake again. And that's what makes us Nigerian. Because we rely on our parents to act in the way that I would even say our parents had, because those communication mechanisms that our parents had, we're improving and evolving, like we talked about this earlier today, in ways that we can understand what it's like to push for success, but maintain our mental health. Be ourselves in public, maybe get ridiculed, but have our people in private that keep us pushing forward. And lastly, you know, I was, I'm like, you know, the girl that plays sports, and I was like, I want to just make sure all the women feel good. I love men, right, clearly, right? But um, I want, I, I don't know, it's my passion, especially here with NECA, like, to make sure the women feel seen, because I think in my position, we are always compared to the men, but not acknowledged to the degree that men are. And so, in, in this experience that I've had, comparison, though, overall, like, while we're navigating that, I always remind myself, comparison is a thief of joy. Comparison is a thief of joy. So, as we navigate who we are allowed to be, whether it's on social media, on air, we're going to make mistakes. The difference is our mistakes are magnified in front of millions. You shoot an airball, everyone sees it. You mess this speak, uh, speak on TV, everyone knows it. Um, there's added pressures and anxieties, especially being women in that space. We have imposter syndrome where we look to our left. I look to my left, I'm like, oh shoot, it's Scotty Pippen. To my right, it's Tracy McGrady. And like, you start thinking, why am I here? And then after looking in the mirror, I remind myself who I am. Two time all star. Well, I'm not gonna do that, but. I'm not leaving my voice. I'm just trying to make a point. But I think we need to. You're an agent. You're an agent. whether it's on our individual journey or this is a team right here, our collective journey, we are committing ourselves to picking each other up and making sure no one is left behind. And that's something that's different. We talk about evil people, we're so comfortable being the one with, oh, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. Like, I got all this thing in my pocket and everyone should look and admire. Why not spread the wealth? That's what's gonna take our culture to the next level. And so I think that mindset all stems from sports. You know, whether it's making a mistake on social media, making a mistake on air, making a mistake in the game, making a mistake recruiting, you know, it all stems for, uh, from sports. And I always tell people lastly, like, it's wired in us just because we play team sports. Everyone play basketball and football up here. And we're wired, ever since we pick football, to care about the last player on the bench as much as we care about ourselves. And so you couple that with that Nigerian principles of you're gonna strive and achieve, we have that team mindset, we will not fail. And so I think that's who we try to align ourselves with. You know, I'm fortunate. I'm forced to trade from oh, Connecticut. You know, that was a time. But forced to trade from Connecticut to LA because I needed to be reminded of that to play with my sister and get more of that. And so as long as you actively seek those scenarios, those circles, your friends, <laughs> your friends, he can tweet. People may not like it, but he's never going to fail because we won't allow him. 
He's too valuable. Same way Sam and Nega and Isaac and uh, Festus are valuable. And so I think that's what keeps us from feeling like we're alone, right? And that's what actually propels us to succeed. <laughs> I think you've been quiet for a bit, so I wanted to ask you this particular question. So you are the one person, your, your sister is a coach, and I've talked about the other fo um, folks on stage, are also involved in sports. You are in real estate investing. So tell us, do you miss it? Do you miss sports? Um, so I would say yes. The answer is short, I would say yes. I definitely miss it. Um, through my transition, when I first transitioned out of sports, it was really hard to, because my the way I left sports was through injury, right? I didn't plan to leave sports as early as I did. I had expectations to play a long career, just like, you know, probably everybody had expectations to play long, uh, uh, many years, championships, things like that. Um, but I left through injury. So it was really, really tough for me uh, the first couple of years just to even like watch sports, talk about sports, things of that sort, you know, just because of the way I left the game. But I always had, um, I always had a dream, right, to be, I, I've always like envisioned myself as being this uh, individual that can bring ideas to reality. And that's through uh, buildings, through real estate, through empowering people, things of that sort. So um, I jumped into it head first. That's the only way I know how to do things is 100%, right? Um, so to answer your question, yes, I, I, I do miss it, but I definitely find joy in what I'm doing right now. my last few questions. I did want to get to this and Janae, you kind of got into a lot of women's aspects in sports. Let's talk about pay disparity. So, um, Aneka and Janae, two of you tagged to this question for me, or answer this question. I just think that, you know, tennis is, I go back to tennis, it is an individual sport, but they're the only sport I know that they get paid the same amount, you know, between the genders. Now, football, basketball, I watch soccer a lot too, so I'll talk about soccer. I know the base structure there. Yeah, I watch soccer. Except for, um, no, baseball. <laughs> baseball. Alright. Anyway, um, soccer. The highest paid soccer player was Messi, the male soccer player. He made 600k a week. Like and then compare that to the highest paid female soccer player. She made 500. That's average. But she, this one made 500K a year. So, and I think the disparity is probably tied to something else. I want you guys to talk about it because I know you're passionate about women's sports and development and bringing you know, more young girls into the sport. So what can we do to bridge that gap? Like, what, or what's being done, if anything? I think the players did an amazing job in negotiating their CBA. Um, what was it? Revenue sharing was at 1.20% and they got it up to 50%. Tied it or the equivalent of the NBA. Those women were at the forefront of that and they brought a list of expectations and wants and they were able to capitalize on that. Um, I look at it as not being a home run, but it's gaining yards in the right direction. As far as the pay disparity goes, I'm starting to look at that college level, because that's where I'm at stationed right now. And the NIL, which is name, image, likeness, I'm starting to think how that will impact players as they continue to progress through their professional careers. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but essentially it's being paid for your image and likeness. Um, so as we continue to go through that process, you think about page buttons, who's just now trademarked page buckets, you think about the Haley Jones of the world. My hope is, is that because women's basketball is such a grassroots um, organization, people like to know what Sinead ate for breakfast, they want to know what our coaches are doing, they want to feel like they're connected on a personal level with the athletes. If we get to a point to where these athletes are now establishing their brands in high school, and when they get to college, we're not helping them build out their brands and they're getting sponsorships, they're getting endorsements, they're becoming um, more household names, but also their followers on all these social media platforms. Those followers are now hopefully going to transition with them and continue to follow them and we can continue to build revenue as we um, progress into their professional fields. It's good, it's good. 
Uh, to jump in there, yeah, I think the game has completely changed. We're all like the college football guys. Football guys here, you guys are probably like so mad. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's getting so much money. Uh, you know, that's the biggest conundrum, uh, pay disparity amongst men and women. And being a women's basketball player, we're often used as the martyrs of that cause. Because it's so blatant within the WBA in comparison to the NBA. Uh, the CBA that we just negotiated at NECA mentioned was groundbreaking, right? Everyone's like, groundbreaking, groundbreaking. I was like, ground establishing. Because it didn't just come with money, it came with full paid maternity leave, which women need. Um, so much so that we got $60,000, because a lot of our players play until the you know, wheels fall off. They should be able to plan for families. $60,000 for veteran players to do adoption, surrogacy, and fertilization. Those are the things only women will think of. And that's why it happened. And so when people saw us get those things, it was on Good Money America everywhere because that fight was so important to us because we knew that they could use that blueprint and take it to the workplace. So other leagues took that and other workplaces took it. And that to us was inspiring, but my God, there's so much work to be done. It's not good, I'm gonna just be honest, it's not a good feeling when you step into a place and people don't even know how much work you have to do as a woman to be there and then immediately are ready to discredit you just for existing. You know, I always tell people, especially black women, that our existence is the resistance because even being there is a testimony for what should have been possible but never has been and you, you predetermined that by your own willpower. And so when I look at the overall pay disparity, I think, and I'm just gonna try to control my game with my mental, We're, I'm a player currently, but I'm trying to be an owner mentally. So while society is built for men per se, white men, we have to own our own shit. No offense, sorry, I don't cuss that often, but we really do. Because what we're thinking about, we know it sure as hell they're not. And if we own it, we can change it. And so um, I think that mentality is starting to be contagious. I realized this the most in 2016, when we almost had our first female president. We had a huge women's march, where everyone stormed in support of women. You guys remember the marches in all throughout our country and all that stuff? And at that moment, we started, like, I think it was symbolic as women, we're like, hold up, we roll deep. They may want to deny one or just a limited number at the door, but if we all pull up together, they can't stop us. Yeah. 